Hi, welcome to Barb's Book Spot. Hi, welcome to Barb's Book Spot. Today I've only selected two books to share with you because I want to share the de design features of these books. I think they're interesting, I think they're exciting for the kids that you're going to be reading to, and even for yourself. I, I have four pages of notes and every time I pick up these books I find one new detail or another new feature that I'd love to share with you. So I just hope I remember to share them all with you today. The first book that I'd like to show you is called Cricket Song. It's written and illustrated by Ann Hunter. And I wanted to show some of the features first. Um, I'm going to take the dust cover and just show you that. There's a tiny little picture of a boat up here. Down here we see the picture of the back of a cat. It looks like a cat sitting on a window or a ledge or something. I'm going to slip to the back. Here we have a snail shell and down there what looks like an island or a volcano with a sunset going on behind. Now right now I don't know anything more about the book than that other than the title, Cricket Song. I'm assuming it has something to do with crickets. Um, maybe the sound they make. The back page, the back um, dust cover, says what sounds do you hear when you fall asleep? And we see a child sleeping by an open window. So the tone is set. Before I've even opened the book, before I've read even one word, the tone is set. And I love that because it sort of puts everybody in the mood to hear the story. So with that, I'm going to take the dust cover off because it's going to fall. The inside cover is the same as the dust cover. That's not always the case. Sometimes when you take the dust cover off, you find that there's a whole different picture going on in here. And that's interesting, too. In this book, the end papers are just plain blue. Again, part of setting that tone, this is like a night sky or a little bit of darkness. So there's nothing going on there, nothing busy. And then the first page, this is called, the very first page of your book, where anything's written, is called the half title page. And on the half title page we see some critters here. They look like they might be otters sleeping on the top of the water. And just the title of the book. And then we get to the title page. Now here we have a full two page spread. And when the picture goes all the way to the edge where there's no white space or there's no framing done here, that's called a full bleed. So full bleed of the picture of a fox. We see some little crickets. The title, and here is where we see who the publisher is. Typically the title page will have who wrote the book, who illustrated the book, and right down here it says Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, Boston, New York. It doesn't always say the, the date here, sometimes it does. Where you find the copyright date is on the verso of the title page, and there you have the complete information. Now I should say that in children's books it's not always true. This is a very traditional way of providing the background information for a book. And this book was published in 2016. Okay, now here's my first real page of the book where I actually have some text, and I'll read that to you. As the sun sails west, bringing the night, the evening breeze rises to meet it. Now, the sun is setting. We have a nice little scene, and I get the feeling there's motion coming this way in the grass, in the water, in the clouds. So I get the sense that the breeze is blowing towards the house. Okay. Inside the house we see a child sleeping. This reinforces my idea about the breeze, the curtains blowing in. And here is one of the most interesting features about this book, this little strip at the bottom. Um, you see right here there's a little yellow house, some trees, a little scene, and then some critters. It looks like it may be bunnies. This We're not sure what that is. Well, I can tell you what that is because it's the same scene. <laughs> Okay, and I know from the cover that there was a fox involved. I'm going to guess that that's the fox. So what we have on the title page is shrunk down in miniature right here. Now, I'm not going to talk about the rest of this right now. I'll come back to that. But there's a whole story going on in just that strip at the bottom, aside from the main part of the story that we're looking at. Um, usually, what's over to the far edge of the page here is going to, it's going to tend to lead you either in ideas or make you want to turn the page to take you on in the story. So we've got the breeze blowing in, we've got the little boy's head by the window. I want to know what's outside that window. And so I'm going to turn the page 
and I'm going to find here's the scene of the house, here's the breeze blowing in, and the text says that there's cricket songs mingling with the creek creek of frogs, so I'm going to look for the frogs, right? I'm a student maybe sitting on the floor and I'm reading the book to the student. The student's going to say, okay, where are the frogs? They're going to find them here. Where are they placed? Right here, where it's going to want me to turn the page to learn more about those frogs. So the, the boy's head by the window, now the frogs, and it's kind of hinted at the text, tells you what's next. So I follow the frogs, here they are. So we've zoomed back in, we get that pattern of zooming out, zooming in. And this text talks about the frogs puffing their throats full of cool air from the woods. Okay, the woods is on the edge of the page over here. The words are here, the woods are beginning here. I want to see what's in the woods, and I find the fox. And again, in these big parts of the pages, all the motions going to the right, it's all encouraging me to go on and read the rest of the story. Okay, now I'm going to go back for just a second and take a look at this bottom part here. So everything that we've been talking about so far in the big pictures is happening over here. And you'll see little bits of movement of the characters and the creatures so that, like if I'm looking for the fox or the, the crickets up here, I might be able to see them down here. In the middle, we have an ocean or a large body of water. I'm going to guess it's the ocean because over here, the landscape is very different. I've got palm trees, um, I've got a volcano, and in the water I see boats going out, like as if they're going out to fish for the day. You'll see action down here. You'll see the guys, the fishermen are casting their nets. You'll see the boats changing position. You'll see whales jumping periodically. So there's a whole story going on in the strip down here that's enhancing and sort of moving along while we're focusing in closer in detail about what this young boy is experiencing in his sleep, the sounds outside his window. Now I'm going to fast forward for a second because right about halfway through the book we see we get to the sea otters which remember from that half title page we saw the sea otters sleeping on the top of the water and then the very next page a full spread of whales. Now I'm in the middle of the ocean, right? And I was over here in the landscape I have a sense that I'm going to be moving to the other shore now. And that's exactly what happens in this book. Because as we go forward, here's the boat coming in. Now, instead of focusing in on this side, I'm focusing in to the action over here. The boat's going to shore. This is another house. Instead of um, frogs, we have parrots and other critters. And here's a child sleeping. Do you remember the snail and the cat from the dust cover? Here's the cat and there's the snail shell. So there's a little bit of reinforcement, there's a little hinting in the, in the dust jacket and the end papers, and then also in the pictures as we see them. And then we end with the very last line is brought on by the evening breeze. Now let me show you something that's really interesting about this book. There's a, a way, a crafting of literature that's called ring form. And I first learned about it in college when I studied the Iliad, and I learned that sometimes a story will start in a place, you find, uh, you travel, whatever happens in the plot, and you end up full circle back where you started, and only you're in a slightly different place. It's not exactly the same place, but you end up somewhat in the same place. So there's a pattern that can be followed. Well, this book is so closely crafted, so let me just show you what I discovered today, and I thought this was really cool. We start out with a picture, a scene, of the house and the landscape around the house. I'm going to go to the very last page, and what do we have here? The scene and the landscape around the house on the opposite shore. Okay, so keep that in mind. I'm going to flip forward again. Here's a child sleeping in bed on the second page. Back here on the second to the last page, the child sleeping in bed. On the third page, I have a close-up view of the house, a little bit better kind of a scene, what's, the crickets are in the grass, kind of a feel of what's going on just outside that window. And here, the scene just outside the window on the opposite shore. I believe that all of those decisions, all of those design decisions are made intentionally, that nothing's happening by accident here. 
And so the author, the illustrator, the editor, everybody that has a hand in it, they're, they're making decisions for a reason. And it all should contribute to the final experience that you have with the book. And I think the very best books do that well. They're very closely crafted, they're well crafted, and you want to read them again and again because every time you pick it up you see one new detail or you realize one new thing. And subliminally it all rings well. We get a sense of time passing, we get a sense of something shared on opposite shores. These children are worlds apart and yet they have the same experience with cricket songs and, and sleeping at night with the window open. That's something we can all relate to. So not only are the characters in this book related, we're related to them by common experience because it's, it's a topic that we can connect to. It's sort of a text to self relationship that we have with the book. So I really love this one, and I think it's a book you're going to want to look at that little strip at the bottom. You're going to want to look at again and again. And I don't know that I'd point out every detail if I was reading this aloud to a group. I think I might read it slowly and allow time for them to ponder and look and listen. But I have a feeling that when I put this book down at the end of class, it's one that all the kids are going to want to come and pick up and try to go and read themselves and take a look at those details a little more closely. So that's one. My second book today, and this is a really fun one, and it's a little different. Some very different design decisions were made. Are We There Yet? And it's a story by Caldecott medalist Dan Santat. Um, you can tell by looking at the cover, it's a little bit wilder than the other. This is no peaceful bedtime story. We have somebody, are we there yet? Now, that's something anybody who has children can relate to. Anybody who's taken a long car ride can relate to. It just feels like forever. We know that elasticity of time, you know, sometimes a minute can seem like hours when you're waiting. Other times it flies by when you're having a good time. So I get a sense that that's going to happen. That's going to be part of the story. We have some very... Um, impatient looking parents like just saying okay just shut up we're going to be there soon enough okay and then up here there's a definite division i see some imagination going on we've got dinosaurs and pirates and all nature of things going on up there the back cover puts us in ancient egypt and i have no idea why we're going there it just says welcome to where whenever you are not wherever but whenever you are i'm getting a i'm getting a sense that time or something to do with time is going to either be a motif or a theme in this book. And then we see um, the family and the car, but everybody's dressed up kind of weird. We've got Dad in a space suit. Mom looks like she's dressed up like Napoleon or something. And the young man's still disgruntled, but he's got a monkey sitting with him. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on. My favorite detail on the back cover, though, is this little robot. And what they've done is used the robot to um, speak the barcode, and in his speech bubble is the actual barcode for the book. So they've created, you know, this is something that has to be there because the publishers need that and the marketers need that, the retailers need that, so they've worked it right into the design of the cover, and I think that's great. All right, now this is a book where the inside cover is not the same as the dust cover. So let me show you first the, the end papers, or the fly leaves rather. We see the dinosaurs and pirates, something in the past is up here. We see the family in the car here, so I get this past, present, and then on the back, this very futuristic looking world. This is the author and the illustrator, and I'm not sure who he's with right there in a car, some real people in a car. And the flyleaf says, welcome to the road trip of a lifetime. All right, now I'm going to take the paper off and look at the book cover. It's like a big present. I have no idea what that is. So this book is mysterious right from the start. But how much fun is that? And present, time present, gift present, is there going to be a play on that word? I'm not sure. The front end papers show me the progression of time. It frames that almost look like a film taking place. I see the sun setting. I see the car moving forward along the way. So the trip is underway. The last end papers, I have a feeling they're coming home here. It's night. Okay, we see the moon rising. The lights are out. And here the title page is all kind of worked into one big spread. Um, right here it says, you're invited to a birthday party. Who? Grandma. When? October 24th, 2016. Where? And it gives an address. And under about this book it says, and I'm just going to read this to you, this book was edited by Bethany Stroud and designed by David Captain. The production was supervised by Erica Schwartz, and the production editor was Andy Ball. So a lot of people 
went into the production of this book, and they all get their credit here, and then the rest of the bibliographic information is here. Here's a real photo of who I assume is maybe the son of the author, and it says, for Kyle, be patient, we have all the time in the world. So again, that reinforcement of the idea of time and patience and something seeming to last hours when it really should be going by more quickly. I'm getting all of that. I haven't even started the story yet. I love that. I see this huge font. I can't ignore that. Are we there yet? Somebody's shouting at me. I see body language and facial expressions that add to my understanding of how these characters feel. And I see the rear view mirror. And I love that touch because if a mom or a dad's looking up, this is what they're seeing in the rear view mirror. And we don't know what our kids do in the back seat all the time. As a parent, I can tell you, we don't always know what they get up to back there. The first page we see in the car, everything's framed in black. And I think that adds to the effect of feeling in a box. You're framed, you're tightened in, you're boxed in, you're sort of trapped within your segment of the world right now. You're looking out the window, are we there yet? I want this trip to be over. This is taking forever. We can see the changes in their facial expressions and body language. And we see all of his um, accoutrements, let's say. There's the gift for whoever they're going to visit, probably grandma. Um, he's got some toys and things. All right, now let me flip forward. Now this is the piece de resistance. So we get to the next page, and we've gone away from frames, and now we've got this full bleed. And I'm going to read this. This little white trail here is where the words are. And it starts here saying, Staring out your window at a thousand miles of road can get boring pretty quickly. Not even all the toys in the world can help. But what happens when your brain, you can see we've changed the text, becomes, and then the line comes here, too bored. Now I have an arrow pointing the other way. I can see him falling asleep. I'm now holding the book upside down, which you can't tell by the cover anymore. If I had the other cover on, you could. But now I have to turn the pages backwards. So I'm completely I've completely upside down and backwards. Now I'm reading backwards. And as I go backwards, you're going to note I'm going back in time. Minutes become hours, hours become days, days become years. That's all the, se that's all the text is saying. But we go back to the time of the Old West. We go back to the time of pirates. We go back to the time of knights and lords and ladies in the Middle Ages. And here comes the car. There are so many details I can't even begin to tell you. We get to ancient Egypt. That's where that back cover came from. And all the while, the little boy's bubbles are saying things like, I have to go to the bathroom, and my butt hurts, and are we there yet? So you get all of this very realistic conversation going on in the car. Then all of a sudden, roar, we're back in frames. Look at Dad. Dad's grown a beard. Okay, so we've not only gone back in time, but time has passed, evidently, or else he's becoming more Neanderthalized, if that's a word. Um, we're back in frames. We're still turning the pages backwards, and we have a beautiful full-page spread in the time of dinosaurs. And, of course, our young man seems very happy about this. He looks really happy. He likes dinosaurs. All right? And we're about halfway through the book now, maybe a little more than halfway. And we go back to frames, and it says, so take a second to savor the moment you're in. This will help. And now we go back and read the right way forward again to the end. This will help the time fly by. Now, something happens that they move through time a little too quickly, and they end up in this very futuristic world. There are some details in the future here that I really like. It's like, you know, like they overshot their mark. They missed Grandma's house and went on into the future because we're in 2059 and the party was supposed to be in 2016. But look at our little robot friend. He's speaking in QR codes here. And I, I thought, boy, I wonder if those are real. So I actually took out my iPad and I, there's an app where you can read that. And they do say something. So later on, if you want to point these out to your students or if you want to go back yourself and see what those little QR codes say, you can do that. But we see this little robot guy taking a picture. It reads almost like a comic book now. They feel like they've missed the party. They're way too far in the future. I'm just going to, the story goes on. I'm just going to point out some details. We see something in the boy's hand here. Now, when the robot took the picture, I'm going to guess that's the picture. The robot gave him the picture he took. But I don't know yet for sure. But I'm going to follow that through the story and see what is that he's holding. I see this yawn. 
I get this idea that maybe he's waking up, you know, we get some bubbles going on here, some kind of indistinguishable items. So that first just waking up, we're here. Here's that red present. Here we're back in the car. He's looking like a kid that just woke up. Here's something flying through the air. It's that paper. He dropped that paper. What is that that he had? You'll want to find out. I'm not going to tell you. You can read and look at that. But they get to Grandma's. They give Grandma the present. I want to just get to the last page. And here's the party at Grandma's. And here she is opening the present. It's a clock. So once again, the time theme, that whole idea of time passing, time past, time present, time future, how the flexibility of time, all of that is sort of woven throughout the story. And it's hilarious. The characters' faces are funny. The comments are funny. And I think that whole notion of picking up the book and turning it upside down to read it back to front, front to back, as you're moving back in time, really adds to the story. So these are two books that I think where you can really see the design of the book enhances and blends and adds to the actual story. I think you'll enjoy these. I think your students will enjoy these. And I have a suggestion for you. Um, whenever you have a chance to read children's books, whether it's once a week or once a month or every day, take one and look at it really closely. Look at the end papers. Look at the fly leaf. Look at the title page or the half title page. Look at the last page and the first page and see where you started and where you end up. Look at the size of the font, the design, all of those features and really think about why those decisions were made. And then read the story again and see if that doesn't change your opinion of the book. And sometimes you'll be very disappointed. Sometimes you'll like 90% and just one little thing will bother you. Other times you'll be delighted and you'll want to share that book with everybody. And everyone I work with can tell you right here, I've shared these books with everybody. So once again, happy reading and I'll see you next time.